welcome everybody to this edition of the IMI Sydney Singapore Convention Mediation Seminar Series. I'm happy to be joined here today by our friends at Sydney, of course. I've got Marcus Lin here as the CEO. Hi, everyone. Um, and of course, if you don't know me, I'm Laura Spillen, the Executive Director of the International Mediation Institute. Great. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. For those of you who haven't joined a webinar before, and for those of you who have, I'm sorry that you're hearing this every week. Um, but if you do have questions, we encourage you to pop them into the Q&A section of the webinar as we're going along. The format will be a presentation followed by the Q&A. So yeah, if you do have anything, anything to ask, any questions for Sarah, pop them into the Q&A section, which you'll find on the bottom of your screen or on the bottom of your phone as well. I think it's the bottom right hand corner. But with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Sarah Blake, who is a friend and an IMI certified mediator, um, a fantastic trainer and advocate for mediation. Um, and she'll be speaking today about culture, process, and so on in the era of the Singapore Convention. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, for having me. Thank you to IMI for hosting us. And also thank you to the team at SIMI. It's a really great pleasure to be here. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, my name is Sarah Blake. I'm a conflict strategist and a multi-award winning mediator. I'm also a second generation mediator. So there's not a lot of us out there, but increasingly so. So I've been working in the industry now for 25 years. Uniquely, probably for many of you, I'm a non-lawyer mediator. So I'm going to bring a really different lens to this conversation today. And I hope that we can have some fun with it. My work these days is mainly with boards, SMEs and leaders to help them engage in the conversations that matter. By creating clarity and confidence, they're really empowered to get on with the business of decision making, innovation and growth. So why do I do this? I want to contribute to a world where our differences don't divide us, but rather they are the opportunities for change. I want to empower people to be brave enough to lean into the messiness of life and see the treasures that are buried beneath the confusion. I was once told, perhaps like others of you, that I should only talk about the feel good things. No one wants to hear about conflict. But if I do that, I'm actually only contributing to the problem. So when I think about the most powerful moments in my life, they have been both the hardest and in hindsight, the most pivotal. And I wanna help people navigate these spaces, these times more effectively. So I wanna share with you a little bit about my experience attending the signing of the convention in Singapore. Um, and then I'm gonna take you through a conversation around three key points, which is culture, process and value proposition. Uh, it was such a privilege to attend the event in Singapore and I think what stood out for me was this gathering of amazing professionals from across the globe that came with excitement and, and hope and aspirations. This blending of ideas, this depth of conversation that occurred and it really invigorated me and in my passion for what we do and, and really connected me with this global community of professionals. When I think about what really, what one moment stood out for me, it was actually a conversation um, the day before at the main forum. And this question was posed to the group around, do we need an Asian model of mediation? And for me, this really uh, got to the heart of the work that I do, which is so much around the multi-party, cross-cultural, high-conflict space. So I guess I emerged from my experience at the Singapore Convention on Mediation, both excited absolutely excited, having met new people, but also a note of caution, a desire for us not to script out the complexities of conflict of people and diminish it to an interpretation of facts. What is this about? It's about bringing people to the process. Most people go to court to get a determination of the facts. They want validation for being right. But we as conflict resolvers and mediators know that life is much more complicated than that. Generally, the facts tend to be easier to interpret. What is more difficult is a complication that humans bring to conflict. Humans are messy. We are all messy. And here is the interesting thing. The truth will look very different for each person. We mediators, I know back here in Australia, and I'm sure it's global as well, we have this saying that goes, there is your truth, their truth, and then something in between. The truth is based on each of our own interpretations of the facts and data, information and experiences. And psychology really reaffirms this for us. 
My concern is that in the international dispute resolution space, that we are diluting the complexities of the problems that arise to merely a determination of facts. Yes, from a judicial perspective, this makes sense. But the reason why so many people are looking beyond determinative models is because the lived experiences show that life is so much more. That justice doesn't always follow the determined facts and that getting back to business when we negotiate solutions is often more enduring. We know that conflict occurs because of people. And whilst they might like to cloak it as an interpretation of facts, let's use workplace as an example, we know that under the facts lay a whole pile of interests that are fueling the fire of conflict. So how does this fit into the issue of culture? What is the problem? We know that the cost of conflict is high. John Storick in 2011 reported an estimated cost of 30 billion pounds to the US UK businesses. Beers in 2020 stated that the top risks for international businesses are associated with foreign exchange and political risks. International conflict happens across borders, jurisdictions, industries, between people. Our cultural differences will necessarily have an impact on how we engage in the business of resolving our disputes. Culture impacts how we communicate, how we negotiate, how we make decisions. Our cultural values and norms are built into our systems of governance. You've probably heard lots of conversations about varying interpretations of what culture is. You've got all the theories between high and low cultures, authority, saving face, gender, language, harmony, relationships, traditions, religion, behavioural norms. These are all important aspects of culture. But too often in the work that I do, I hear stories of people attempting to administer to cultural protocols and forgetting that culture informs how we are, the systems that generate and drive us in our decision making. So if our role is to help people resolve their conflicts, we also need to start questioning our own assumptions so that we can better engage in helping parties prepare for effective negotiations. We need to be conscious of the cultural lens the cultural lens for the parties and for ourselves. Very often in the international space, we're only relying on the legal lens, which is quite different from a multidisciplinary approach. We have to think about the conscious and unconscious bias that drive what we do, how we do, and the questions that we ask. From a legalistic perspective, the lawyers and the judges, their frame of reference necessarily is around how they interpret and, in and determine the value of those facts. Justice and law are about the determination of those things. Whose argument is more powerful? <clears throat> in mediation, we look for the resolution of conflict in a way that recognises the complexities of people. International con commercial conflicts are no different because they are driven by people. A conflict dispute will be fueled, in some cases, by how we interpret words of conflict. The interpretation conflict emerges because of difference. Differences in people, how people assess, analyse, interpret, weigh and prioritise words in a contract. We can have a fight. We can even have a battle. And the costs will generally be high. In mediation, we want to move people away from the battle and reframe their focus on what really matters to them. Culture influences the systems of decision-making. In doing so, it fundamentally asks us to question our own assumptions about the operational nature of our model. And Joel Lee discusses this in 2016. Um, and some of the questions we should be thinking about is, what is appropriate within the mediation model? What, what is negotiable? And what is non-negotiable within the process? And to be able to do this, we have to understand the mediation process as more than a tick box experience. We have to understand the why, why this matters both from a cultural perspective and a process perspective. When working in the international space, we are dealing with complex organisations who are used to working in diverse contexts. Let's not be afraid 
of these conversations? How do we bring parties together for effective decision-making? They are ultimately about how we can better design a process that meets the cultural needs and maximises the potential for positive outcomes. So culture matters, but we can bridge the divides for effective negotiations if we build the conversation into our preparation and process design. And I do this work a lot when I'm working um, in remote Aboriginal communities across borders, across um, jurisdictions. And it is about having the courage to have a conversation around what matters to you in the process design. What cultural aspects do we need to take into consideration? It takes longer, but by doing the prep work in the front end, we actually condense the back end. We make it flow quicker. So how do we change the operational paradigm? And this is why process matters. People, they want to feel valued and important. And I think this is true from whatever cultural background you come from. People want to feel safe, safe to negotiate the things that matter to them. So how do we change the operational paradigm? How do we do our jobs in a way that becomes part of the negotiation of the process itself? The Global Pound Conference report in North America stated that parties seek more control over the process. They want to be active participants and often want a role in the design of the process and generating options. We're hearing this, the evidence is telling us this. So we need to find the ways to design a negotiation process that addresses both the context, the contextual needs of the parties, not just the content. An example, I guess, of how you can develop that process design from a complex multi-party dispute, uh, five steps that I generally go through. And the first is really about understanding the context. This is the context within which the conflict is occurring. It's not the details, but what is impacting more broadly. Then it's about understanding the content. So we explore the content. From here, we're better able to design and negotiate a process based on the needs of the parties and stakeholders. Number four is about establishing rules of engagement. This is what gives us uh, the, the, the structure for hosting and holding that mediation. And then step five is really about action in process. It's applying and implementing these things that we design together. What this does is it empowers both the parties and the solution. It, it creates a legitimate process and is facilitated by a mediator with real and legitimate authority over process. This is a strength that it actually empowers a mediator to really hold that room with a different type of strong authority. In an international world where our diversity can provide the greatest opportunities for growth and innovation, wouldn't it be wonderful if we were readily able to provide the space for this change in mindset? which leads us to the value proposition in the era of the Singapore Convention on Mediation. For such a long time, the mediation world, mediation industry has relied on lawyers to advocate for mediation. We have provided a service that we think will help parties. But the ways of business are changing and we need to adapt and respond to this. Otherwise, we risk being relegated to just another legal option when in fact mediation provides opportunities for so much more. I want us to flip our thinking as we consider value, not from our own perspective, but from the parties. What are the problems that they are dealing with? What are the implications and how might we provide services that really add value to the peacemaking process? In the international commercial space, when conflict emerges, what really matters to our clients. It includes things like getting back to business as quick as possible. This whole thing costing as little as possible. Creating opportunities for growth and innovation. Brand reputation, positioning in the market, authority. We don't want to lose face, drawing a line in the sand and being respected. The Singapore PM, Li Xian Long said at the signing of the ceremony, that businesses will benefit from greater flexibility, efficiency and lower costs, while states can enhance access to justice by facilitating the enforcement of mediation or mediated agreements. How do we resolve our differences internationally in a way that is timely, cost efficient 
and allows us to maximise the opportunities for business growth. These aren't just fact-based disputes, even though they are commercial in nature. And we do a disservice to our clients if we want to reframe and refocus on a factual interpretation of facts through mediation. Mediation is much more than that. And we, as practitioners, have an opportunity to reposition our value not just as an extension of a determinative judicial decision-making, but as something new, something that actually focuses on the clients, their problems, what they need, future focus. We know there is value in mediation. Parties and the corporate community themselves see value in mediation as a distinction from other models of dispute resolution. As a pro profession, we have the chance to re-examine what is the value, to look beyond their own lens, to look beyond self-interest and examine what the parties in conflict are looking for. There is scope there. The Singapore Convention on Mediation creates that flexibility to respond to the cultural context and process needs of parties. And for our clients and ourselves, we can be brave enough to start asking those questions. What matters, what might be possible, and how can we deliver a model, deliver a model that brings people to the forefront? Ultimately, I want to challenge you all to consider how to bring people back to the room. How do you explore the assumptions of culture and translate this into practice through the negotiation of process? And how do we help clients articulate value? How can we navigate through our differences as an industry, as practitioners, to find a solution that is complex in its nature, specialised to our needs, and values those things that matter to us more than and as well as the interpretation of the law? So thank you for the time to share my views and my experience on uh, attending and the potential that is provided by the Convention. Super. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was really great. In fact, we've had some uh, some compliments submitted by the Q&A as well. Um, Thanks, everyone. <laughs> I mean, one person says that it's superb. We've also got another person saying that they particularly appreciate the reminder that justice does not always follow judgment. I think it's a really good point. Great, but we do have some other questions as well. Um, a couple of people actually asked about what it means to be a second generation mediator. I mean, how do you think this has actually affected you and your practice? Uh, great. I love this question because I don't get to share it very often. Um, I think it's had a profound impact on me because I, I actually have grown up with the language of um, mediation and dispute resolution as part of my life from a very young, young age. And I, I think probably the biz biggest distinction is that mediation and conflict resolution now is more than just a process. It's a lived experience. And my, my challenge, challenge and aspiration is putting that into practice in the everyday. So for me, mediation now means something much more. It's a way of thinking, I think. And so it becomes very natural to me to apply what I do and be authentic and maintain the integrity to those, uh, I guess, principles um, in what I do. Super. And we've got a question from, and you do it very well, may I say, as well. Throw that in there. Um, <laughs> try, just try our best. <laughs> <laughs> we've got a question here from Ilan Bas, um, who asks, what do you think is the impact, both positive and negative, of not having a legal background on your work as a mediator? And can you offer those of us who don't, don't have that legal background um, any advice on how to develop careers in the practice? Okay, two parts. Let's see if I can get the first one. <clears throat> I think it's a really interesting thing about being a non-lawyer practitioner. I have a slight advantage because my father's a barrister and my brother's also involved in teaching law. So I know the language of law, I feel very comfortable in that space. One of the things for me is that um, I'm not intimidated and I'm able to lean into that space in a way that um, isn't a competition and it isn't one way or the other. For me, I'm very conscious of enabling the parties to make the best decisions they can. And to do that, they need information. And that means they need legal information and they need to be engaged in that. 
I know on occasions when I'm perhaps mediating in a remote community where access to lawyers for both parties can be really limited, sometimes I'll take a lawyer as my support person. And that's a lawyer who I know understands mediation and is able to offer really general generic legal advice or provide some guidance to me around questions that are useful to ask. And that way people can test their thinking. We can make sure we get the right questions on the table um, without diminishing the, their capacity to make good decisions. So I think it's not about an us or them, rather how do we work together to provide the best opportunities for parties. Um, and so I, I always bring that. I would rather work with really competent lawyers in the room. I would rather um, us engage and help identify the right issues together. Um, so that's part one. <laughs> part two, um, how, do we, how do you establish a career as a, a non-lawyer? Um, it can be very difficult, but I think it's really, there are enormous opportunities for people if you think outside the, lock, the box a little bit, because the skills and process of mediation can be applied across any aspects where we engage and interact as people. We are all dealing with difficulties. We are all struggling to know how to disagree with each other in a constructive way. So as a mediator that's a non-lawyer, look to the niches that you're passionate about and find the way to gain the experience in helping people make decisions. So, you know, for instance, the family um, dispute resolution field is one of those areas. You've got environmental, you've got um, workplaces, you've got a whole pile of a range of opportunities where you can nurture your profession um, without being a lawyer. And I, I think as an industry too, we need to make sure we make space for the conversation and how, how valuable it is that we aren't all lawyers. Because when we carry our own legal frame of reference, whether we're conscious or not, it really limits the scope of our questioning and, it, and our capacity to explore complex problem solving. And the research is around complex problem solving, that we need multidisciplinary thinking, which means we need lots of different people. And all the research out there is about, we need more diversity, we need different ways of thinking, we need different skill sets, and we can't all be everything for everyone. So I want to really encourage non-lawyer professionals to be confident in this space, to hold your own. It is about how we manage good process and how we engage in communication with parties. Mm -hmm. Great. And I actually have a question um, myself, because you talked a bit about, uh, you know, culture and needing to sort of disengage from our own cultural lens, right? And of course, when we think about intercultural mediation or negotiation, we're often thinking international. But of course, a lot of your practice, well, like some of your practice has actually been with the Indigenous groups within Australia. So, I mean, like, what for you has actually been that process? How have you sort of been able to disengage from that cultural lens or recognise your own lens so that you're more able to mediate in that kind of situation? Yeah, I don't think it's disengaging from your own cultural lens because um, my cultural lens is who I am and, and it gives me my strength and my capacity. It's my backbone to be able to do what I do. What it is about is being self-aware of those those things and being able to engage in a conversation with someone about it. So my work in Aboriginal communities, for instance, I remember the very first time I went out to a remote community and I was a very young white woman in a very remote Aboriginal community, very traditional. And I went out there and I sat down with these two elders and I said to them, look, thank you for having me out here. I just want to say that I know that I'm a young white woman and I may not be the right person for this conversation. This is what I bring. This is my experience and my skills. What would you like me to do? And I, I made the space for the conversation. And, and from that point of vulnerability and freedom, we actually negotiated, yep, you do have authority. This is where I want you to go and this is what you want to do. So I think that moment for me was pivotal around acknowledging that we all bring our cultural lenses and let's have a conversation. And, and you have to know the foundations of the process to be able to engage in that conversation. So it's challenging us as practitioners. You can't be surface level here. You have to be confident to dive deep into the whys of the process, not just let's tick a box and do this. Absolutely. I, I totally agree with you, Sarah. And actually, sometimes when I'm teaching, I talk about that we're actually creating a mediation culture when we meet with these people. And I mean, when you talk about process, mediation process, they're the kinds of things we actually bring together and discuss to establish that mediation culture. We've got a question from Matthew Sebastian, um, and it's slightly away from culture, 
would more ethical rules of conduct and procedural rules enhance public confidence in mediation, or do you think they would adversely affect it? And another two-parter, should mediators be held liable for making a judgment call or using the discretion as mediation is a voluntary process after all? Okay, let's uh, remind me if I miss any of these points. But the first one around ethics, um, and I, I think ethics is an important conversation, but the risk about setting standards of ethics is that you set a, a lowest common denominator. What we actually want of the profession is we want to encourage and inspire people to set the highest standard they can in the conversations of ethics. And the challenge around ethics is we never actually know our own ethical strength until we're faced with a challenge. So um, I think it is around how we um, engage again in the conversation of what's important to you and what's important to me. And, and we, you know, yes, we need um, basic standards, but we need to set that as the starting point for the conversation because ethics will mean different things to me than it will mean for you. And so let's start from a position of curiosity rather than from a position of um, absolute. Um, the second question, part of the question was around should mediators be held liable? I think that or was one of the... Making a judgment call or is in the discretion given that mediation is a voluntary process? Yeah, it's an interesting thing. Here in Australia, mediation is increasingly not voluntary. So there's uh, mandatory requirements to attend mediation, which, as we know, really challenges the um, long-held notion that mediation is a voluntary process. What do you do with that when it's not actually voluntary? I think that, um, that these are really important considerations we need to give to law, and they're important considerations in terms of around professional standards of the industry. And this confusion between... It's a very fine line, I think, when a judge, when a mediator makes a judgment call in a mediation or heavily influences the direction of decision making. So parties need to have confidence about the roles and responsibilities of the mediator. So those standards are really critical. But I think there's also this notion, what I tend to do in my own practice is um, put the question back to parties. So I pose the questions to parties around what they do. So it's not actually me making a judgment call um, generally, um, rather it's around the parties themselves. There are exceptions to that around when I would make a, a judgment call. And those exceptions tend to be process orientated, not content orientated. And I make a very clear distinction of that when the parties themselves. It's about us being transparent with the parties about our own decision making. Super. And so I guess a slightly related question from an anonymous attendee, being very mysterious. How can a mediator help parties to the mediation be more active in the process, especially in designing that process of mediation themselves? Yeah. Um, it's a really, for many people, they've never experienced going through mediation. In fact, a lot of people haven't had the experience of going through court or bringing in a lawyer. And when you have to do that for the first time, it can be a really int intimidating process. So part of the role really as, as process designers and, and particularly in the work that I do, I, I place a strong emphasis on um, empowering parties through the pre-mediation process. They need to feel safe to be able to engage. And if in a mediation at whatever stage people are feeling uncertain and you're noticing in the room that they're just not engaging in the conversation, it probably means they're not feeling that it's safe, they're not feeling it's okay to speak up, they might be confused, there might be a whole pile of fears and barriers that are stopping them actively participating and our job as mediators is to address those concerns. So for me, the sooner I, I address them, the better. And my risk management is about doing it during the pre-mediation work. So I, I spend more time at the front end in pre-mediation, helping parties understand what this process is about what it looks like, what I can negotiate on and what their needs are. What do they need in a negotiation process? What will make them feel comfortable? What is this issue about? And help them really unpack how to communicate that to the other parties. Help them create clarity around what their needs are, what their options and alternatives, all those usual reframe and reality testing things that we do in mediation. I always do it with a lens on future focus because I, particularly in high conflict cases, 
Um, if we allow parties to fixate on the hurt and pain of the past, um, it's very hard to transition them towards solution focused. So in high conflict cases, it really is about giving them some space to air what they need to. And so by the time they come back as, or come together as um, multiple parties, they're ready to start that next stage. So front end preparation, helping them understand what's going to happen and um, addressing what's going on at the time. I hope that answers that question. I could talk about that topic for hours. <laughs> Three hours time, it'll be the middle of the night for you. <laughs> okay. got, I think a follow-up question to the previous question about judgment calls um, from Gabo Fakas. And they ask, wouldn't it be better for a mediator to maintain their neutrality even when they have the expertise to address an issue and instead call in an expert, like a separate expert to offer an answer? Yeah. Uh, this is a it's a really complex question because what we are seeing emerging in the mediation industry is this um, at sometimes a tendency, particularly of ex-judges, to step into the role as mediator. And, and sometimes parties um, seek them over others to mediate because they want someone who actually brings a much stronger determinative process to mediation in which they, yes, they are actually making judgment calls. And so the way they influence the decision making is probably much more determinative, but it's hard to know because we're not in the room. Um, personally, I guess I'm probably more of a traditionalist in my own approach because I actually am very strong around my role as not being a, a content expert. And that's why parties have legal representatives to be their conflict experts. They're the ones that should be advising their parties on the right questions to ask to get the information they need to make decisions. But as I said previously, you know, I will bring in an expert if I think that would be useful to the process because I'm, I'm very conscious of the more information parties have, the better, but my role is to manage the process, not to contribute to the content. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so we've got two slightly related questions here. And so one person says that um, with regard to facts adjudication determination, lawyer mediators do find it difficult, away from, uh, difficult to move away from that judgment-based approach. And they say that the biggest culprits are sort of judge mediators. So what advice do you have for lawyer mediators specifically um, to, to, keep, to actually sort of stay in that gray space and not jump to conclusions during the process? Yeah. Um, it's a really hard, hard thing to do. So I do a lot of training of newbie mediators um, and particularly lawyers that come in that want to learn how to do mediation. And I think this is wonderful and the more people and the more lawyers that understand what mediation is, the better. But it is a very difficult hat to take off the lawyer hat. Just as it is very difficult for psychologists who come in to mediate and take over the role of mediation. Because for a psychologist, their lens, their focus, their passion often is around the emotional well-being of parties. So the, the psychologists will tend to err towards um, providing counselling support, for example, or emotional support. Whereas legal lawyers who are conducting mediation um, would tend to err towards their comfort zone. What, is, what, is, what are they more comfortable with? What do they know really well? And they know really well their role in law. The interesting thing about mediation is that it bridges those spaces. It's not strictly um, the, the determinative and it's not counselling. It's actually something very distinct. And so what I, what I know of training is that not everyone can be a really good mediator. And as a profession, we need to be okay with saying that and really celebrating the distinction of mediation. So for lawyers that are stepping into the role, I, I really encourage you to um, immerse yourself in what it means to manage process. You know, practice it where you can of disengaging from being a subject matter expert. You gotta put your ego aside, put it out back for a little while, because right now it's not about you, it's about the parties. And, and you learn that through practice. And sometimes it's messy. I really encourage, particularly newbies, find a great co-mediator. You know, even if you're doing it by free, sit in and learn what it is to hold process well. Because once you see it, this light goes off and you go, yeah, that's what it's about. But it is a hard habit to break if you're used to being the one to make decisions, if you're used to being the expert in the room. And as mediators, the parties are the experts of their own conflict. Mm -hmm. The parties are, not us. They know what's going to work best when they go back to work. 
So if we're looking at long-term sustainable outcomes, how we make this real beyond the, the, the boardroom, they need to be able to reality test and really make this real for themselves. You won't know that, they will. Great. And actually, from another perspective, then we've had another question who asks, as a mediator, how do you work around the sometimes adversarial approaches of the lawyers without appearing to drive a wedge between lawyers and clients? Yes. Um, it, uh, right back at the beginning, I think I mentioned around how important it is we work well with lawyers in the room. Um, one of the things that I do is that I always have a brief with the lawyers before I bring them into the room. So I need to be really clear about my expectations around how we're all going to work together and how um, that relationship, uh, the parties and the lawyers, how we maintain the integrity of that. And the questioning that, that I do is, is not to diminish the power of any party in the room. And lawyers being one of those people. What we have to do is how we enrich the information that's on the table so that everyone can be full participants to good decision-making. I hope that answers that question. I think it does. It sounded really good. <laughs> we've, we've got a point of curiosity here from Vasiliki Panel, who asked, hey, how, <laughs> who asked, how familiar is the community of Australia with mediation? Uh, mediation is, um, in a sense, mainstream in Australia. And, and I, I'm wondering in some ways if that's what's held Australia back from prioritising um, signing the convention. Because um, mediation is a part of every jurisdiction at every level. Um, it is uh, right from community-based up to the federal court. Um, it's court annexed um, in the family dispute resolution space. You're required to participate in mediation before you can take those next stages. So, so mediation itself is widely accepted as um, part of the process of dispute resolution. But I do think there is a challenge in Australia that people know the word mediation, but they don't necessarily know what it means. So, for instance, in, in workplaces, I'll constantly hear from people saying, oh, yeah, we did a mediation, and I know that what they did was nothing like what mediation should be. So, you know, we've got a long way to go. I think as an industry, we haven't been very good at articulating the value mediation has to engagement and communication in decision making. So we as a profession need to get much better at, at helping people understand why this is a useful thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I also really enjoy your, your voices for the different conflict parties. And so we've got a couple of questions here still about Australia and the role of the, being a mediator within Australia. One person asked, is there immunity in the law for mediators from liability to a party? And they sort of they say that Malaysia has this mediation act, whereas Singapore does not. Um, and another person, Michael Lamb, asks whether Australian mediators have professional indemnity, so related. Um, and can you be registered as a professional person as a mediator, despite being a non-lawyer? So I guess can it be an official an official job? Yep. In Australia, uh, we actually led the way. Way, uh, way back in terms of establishing national mediation standards. So we were one of the first countries um, that wrestled with the process of creating national standards. Um, what's happened in Australia now is that it's a voluntary process. You're not required to register to national standards, but it's strongly encouraged that um, you do so. And you do so because there's a number of requirements for professional, ongoing professional development. If you're registered to national standards, you're required to have insurance. So um, that's a safety protection for you as a practitioner, but also for the parties themselves. We, as part of that process, the requirements um, have about a, a mediation agreement, which covers all things around indemnity. The courts themselves are pretty supportive of mediation, so tend to respect the um, terms of the contracts established around confidentiality and indemnity and disclosures. So uh, the Australian system is very supportive of a strong, independent and confidential mediation process. And I think that enhances its legitimacy across the nation. Um, I, th I would love to see an increase in the requirement to um, register as a national accredited mediator. Um, certainly um, in the family dispute resolution space, you have to be. Um, so I, I guess I always encourage um, users of our service to say, check that your mediator is registered. 
check that they, if they are registered, they have to have insurance. If your protection, it's their protection. Absolutely. So I've got a question here. Well, more of a comment from Anne Christine Kelston in Ireland. He says that the approach in Ireland used to be close to counselling, but there's now strong push in the legal profession. So, um, but so reconciling both of these sort of counselling and legal profession aspects can be quite difficult. And she said that she really likes your uh, your illustration of co-mediation as a great way forward. And to that note, we actually have a question about this from Brian Chang, who asked, do you personally have an experience participating in a co-mediation or concurrent mediation arbitration? What are the positive points and difficulties you encountered with each? Yep. Um, so way, way back 25 years ago, I started the profession um, with the co-mediation model. And it was a co-mediation model in community-based dispute resolution. So my stomping ground was that. And I am incredibly grateful for that experience because I got to learn off the shoulders of some wonderful practitioners and, and do it in a way that was safe. Um, that I knew I had backup. If I stuffed up and asked the wrong question as I got started, it was okay because someone was there to pick up the pieces. Um, I remember one of my mediations a little bit further on, co-mediation model. Um, it was a very, very heated and difficult um, case. And it was great to have a co-mediator because we bounced off each other in the process. It was kind of like good cop, bad cop in the process. Some of the benefits of co-mediation is that, we, can't, as I said earlier, we can't all be everything to everyone. So having someone who can watch while you manage or pick up on some curiosities or a, a phrase that you might have missed uh, can be really rewarding. It's also really great in co-mediation when they bring a particular expertise. So in the native title space, you might have someone that's um, really great at process design and managing mediations, but has no experience working cross-culturally. And that lack of experience can be incredibly detrimental to a mediation process. So then to be able to combine specialised skill sets, um, you know that you can better manage complex cases. I think that there are some risks with co-mediation and uh, having had some not so great experiences, I can vouch for this. You need to have a high level of trust in the person you're co-mediating with. If you don't know about them, if you don't know their style and how they operate, it can be really challenging. I was only speaking to a colleague not too long ago and she's had, uh, she had a very um, challenging and difficult co-mediation experience of someone who talked over the top of her, who didn't want to listen and actually intervened at the wrong moment and really... Um, broke down the potential for agreement. And so those sort of cases when you might have very different styles of communication, where you might bring to the mediation process very different models and you have yourselves negotiated that, it will get in the way of good out outcomes. Um, another advantage of co-mediation, um, particularly around complex multi-party cases, we're seeing a more, I guess, more of a case management approach internationally for these cases. And, and what it is, it's a recognition that complex cases need teams of people to manage them properly. So you might have a mediator on your team who is really great at the preparation process and they might take that task on. You might have someone else who's really good at managing multi-party dynamics, that logistical coordination of people, and someone else who has the technical skills. And you might not use them all together at once, but as a team, you're better able to administer to the challenges of complex decision-making. So I see a lot of benefits of it. I see benefits in the international commercial space, particularly around expertise versus process design and management. Um, and you may not um, use those specialists for the whole process, but you may bring them in for segments. There's some amazing stuff coming out of Canada in terms of med art. Um, and I think some of those examples of the pre-negotiated roles and responsibilities is really useful. So whatever you do, make sure you are really clear about the roles and responsibilities, the interactions, and you're transparent with that with the parties. Because if you um, have your co-mediator off-sider with you and it starts to turn to shit and suddenly you say, oh, by the way, they're going to be the, making an arbitrarial decision here, that's not going to be great. So it is about us being really disciplined about those things. Sure thing. Um, great. And just actually back to culture, I, I, I love your answer there. I think you're bang on. Like, I think it's a really good insight into the challenges that can be faced during a co-mediation. I mean, 
no, we'll, we'll go back to culture because I've, I've got another question from Ada Akinci, um, who asks actually, like, do you think disputes between minorities should be mediated by somebody from those cultures or someone completely externally? I mean, what do you think are the strengths and weaknesses of those approaches? Oh, such a good question. Um, I can really speak from personal experience from this, from working in remote Aboriginal communities. So um, these are often communities which are um, in incredibly disempowered intergenerational trauma, people that are suffering um, poverty, health, um, disempowerment by the systems, um, but also uh, very diverse cultural uh, norms and values. And sometimes when conflicts emerge in these spaces, um, outsiders or even insiders will say, we want a person from this community to resolve it. And other times I'll hear um, these communities say, actually, we don't want someone from inside because someone from inside is too close to the dynamic. And if this goes wrong, um, then they're gonna have to live with it. And if they are too close to everything, they can't ask the hard questions. They can't be neutral because they're too close to the situation. So, so what I always say is that in these cases, ask the question. Give people choice because when we give people choice, they feel empowered and able to own whatever choice is made. You may not like it. I always say to parties when I go out to remote Aboriginal community, even if I'm appointed by government to go out there, I check in with them and say, look, this is who I am. Are you, you are happy to have me manage this process for you. And I'm open to them saying no. And that's absolutely okay with me if they say no. One of the other tricks that I do if, I, if they say yes and they want an outsider is I always try to work with a cultural counterpart. So in these remote communities and minority groups particularly, part of my pre-mediation negotiations are around is there a respected person from both parties that you would both be willing to work with me as the cultural counterpart? These are the individuals that know the business and the culture and the norms of this group. I don't, I'm an outsider, but these things will be important. So how can we work together in a way that um, respects and empowers people and gives them choice? Great. And I mean, while you're talking about this bag of tricks, we've had a question from Eugenia Sefridi who asked um, about the difficulty of mediating between parties with different cultural backgrounds, with cultural bias and sometimes hostility between them. I mean, what are some of the tricks you can bring to the table as a media there to help actually have these parties speak? Yeah, look, big sigh. <laughs> That's the challenge, isn't it, of the work we do. Um, there's a whole part of my toolkit is quite large and we shake it around all the time. I think probably the biggest thing I think is the way I am. So how I am sets the tone for the environment and the people that I'm dealing with. I'm also very confident in setting my boundaries. So I'll often work in communities that are in the midst of high conflict. So police might have been out, police might still be out. There might have been rioting happening or might still be rioting happening. And I, I guess I've done this enough now to feel confident in knowing how to keep myself safe and how to hold space with authority. And holding space with authority also means setting standards and letting everyone know what's okay and what's not okay. So if I'm feeling confident, those parties to the dispute will also feel more confidence in my capacity to hold this space safely. If I show a moment of, oh no, this is not going well, they're gonna pick up on, their, on my panic and, and that's not good for anyone in the process. So, so that's probably my number one thing. Um, we do a lot of one-to-one multi-party work. So, sorry, one-to-one -one smaller group work. And, and that is part of the reason also why um, I don't bring them together unless I can um, have a high level of confidence that this isn't going to escalate the violence. So we have to do all that prep work before we bring them together. And even when we bring them together, we manage that. And we might start little doses and longer doses. I've had cases that have operated over 18 months. I've had I've worked with other communities where we've done, we've first gone into a community and then four years later, it's only then that they're ready for the mediation. So it's about meeting people where they're at. 
It's about designing a process that empowers and keeps them safe. So we do a lot of gender work. So working with women, working with men, working with one particular clan group and another clan group and negotiating who can you talk with and who can't you talk with. All of these are around process design questions to both minimise risk and empower the parties in decision making. Mm -hmm. Super, fantastic answer. And I can see other people are responding to that person with reading the recommendations, which is great. And we just went to the Singapore Convention for a moment then, because you sort of touched on this a little bit earlier, um, but someone whose name I'm going to butcher, so apologies that I'm not pronouncing it, um, has asked, why do you think Australia is not a signatory to the Singapore Convention? And I guess moving forward, what do you think would cause Australia to actually sign? Yeah, I, I have had a lot of cause to really think about why this is. And, and one was a note of the question around, I guess, the example of how, um, there isn't this pressing need in Australia to um, join the convention because we've got it working pretty well here. And, and I think that, um, so, so there isn't that, I guess, priority need to do that. But I also think there's been a challenge in Australia around how we bring our practitioners together to put pressure on government to sign up to this agreement. So I think that there's been some fragmentation in the industry itself around how we communicate and, and collectively empower the industry. And, and I think that's a really interesting, probably critical reflection of where our industry is at and, and also realistic. I think there are tensions in our industry um, between um, uh, approaches to dispute resolution so the predominantly um, determinative versus facilitative, lawyers versus non-lawyers. And I think that um, the work opportunities are somewhat limited for mediators. Um, I don't know if people have seen, there's an amazing report that came out of New Zealand around um, a reflection, a report on the num who's getting the commercial mediations in New Zealand. And when you break down the figures, there's a very small percentage of people that are getting most of the work. And most of those people getting most of the work are lawyer-based uh, white men. And so it poses a challenge around this sense of competition in the industry around, well, if we do that, um, will that disadvantage me or will it give me advantage? So I think we have some cultural challenges in our industry itself around how we um, collectively come together and support each other rather than see each other as competitors. Uh, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more with that. So thank you for that, Cal, for that question, Keen Cal. Marcus told me how to say your name. Um, and so, I mean, how do you think the Singapore Convention more broadly will actually help in the development of the mediation profession, um, especially for younger mediators? I, I think it gives it a status um, that perhaps was lacking before. So the legitimacy um, that it gives to this as a profession, I hope inspires and provides an aspirational um, opportunity for new and emerging mediators to say, hey, look, this is actually a really valid way of engaging in the business of decision making and that you have something to offer. I think that it really creates, um, particularly internationally, uh, it, this common language, this bridge between um, a really different way of resolving disputes and, and this, the convention links us all together. And that was certainly evident at the signing ceremony. And, and I think that was such a powerful um, gathering of like-minded individuals and countries excited in the capacity and the potential to change the way we as society deal and view conflict. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm really excited by that as potential. Um, but I, but I, as I said earlier, I do see some risks if we allow one voice to be heard more than other voices. So I don't want the international commercial dispute resolution space to be dominated by a legal frame of reference. It's really important, but it's not the only voice. So as a profession, I want to encourage us all to really give value and purpose and space to our diversity. I want to hear from cultural backgrounds, gender backgrounds, process differences, 
different industries. I want to hear people that um, are entrepreneurs that are learning about mediation. I want to learn about psychologists and counsellors and engineers and whatever you have and do. We all have a role to do this and we all contribute to peacemaking when we do it together. Absolutely fantastic, Sarah. And I mean, I was going to ask another question, but I don't think there's a better way we can finish it off than on that note. So thank you so much for this talk today. It sounds like people have really enjoyed it. I know I have. I thought you've brought some really, uh, really valuable comments and discussions to the table. And of course, we'll be talking again in future. So thank you to Sarah. Thank you to the attendees for your fantastic questions. Thank you to Marcus and Simi. Um, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. Bye. Bye.